You can be seated. And this morning we're going to be in Luke in chapter 17. We're going to start with verse 12. And Jesus has entered a certain village. He's on his way to Jerusalem, but he's pretty far away from it still. He's near Samaria and Gal Galilee. And it says here that they, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood far off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, I want you to say that with me, as they went, they were cleansed. They were cleansed as they went. As they went, they were cleansed. The go show yourself to the priests is an interesting statement because under the Mosaic law, under the, which they would have known, the lepers were not allowed to roam around the city and be around people unless they had shown themselves to the priest to, sh to prove that they were better. So if a leper got better, they went to the priest, and the priest would confirm that they were better. And after that confirmation, then they could... Otherwise, they weren't around, allowed to be around everybody. They had to be afar off. And as they walked around, they would say, unclean, unclean, out, out loud. That was what they had to do. And it really is a picture of, of uh, how we feel and how we might perceive ourselves before we came to the saving knowledge and the redemption of Jesus Christ, we felt very unclean. And, and so here these men, when they were told, go show yourself to the priest, it's an interesting thing that Jesus told them because he was saying, you're all better now, so you have to go get confirmation from the priest that you're all better. But the reality was is that they would have looked at themselves and said, I'm not all better. Like nothing's changed. They were cleansed as they went. And they may have gone a long ways. In fact, we know they did travel a decent ways because one of them came running back to say thank you to Jesus because he was healed. And it had been some distance that he had traveled. So it was several minutes, maybe an hour, maybe two hours. In fact, the journey back to Jerusalem from where they were may have been a day or two days. It was a long journey. So they were leaving on a journey to go and do something that would not have made sense because they still had leprosy when they left. Does that make sense? So this was an putting their faith into motion. And this is what I want to talk to you to, about today, is the power of putting your faith into motion. You see, nothing was going to happen. If, if one of them had said, forget it, I, I look the same. Why would I go to the priest? Why would I go show myself to the priest? And, why would I do that? And if he had stayed, say five of them stayed back and just said, that's dumb, I'm not going to go. Those five would not have gotten, because they were cleansed as they went. There had to be emotion applied to their faith. See, when faith comes to you, we have to put that faith into motion. There has to be some kind of effort. You see, time and again in the word of God, Jesus comes up to the, the lame man and he says, get up, pick up your mat and walk. That's his declaration of healing. It's a command to do something. So without the effort, if he doesn't try to get up, he's not going to get the healing. Also with the man with the withered hand, stretch out your hand, he said to him. And when he, when he, when he, when he, when he stretched out his hand, then it was healed. There was a motion to the, see, God comes to, G, to Joshua. The Lord comes to Joshua and says, see, have I not given Jericho into your hands? They were going to the promises of God, and God's promises are yes and amen for you. They are your inheritance, and God is saying they're yours. It's blessed you in the spiritual realm with every spiritual blessing. It's held for you in the heavenlies. It's already yours. You are blessed. But when he said to Joshua, see, have I not given Jericho into your hands? The reality was that Jericho did, was not in Joshua's hands. The walls were still up, and it still belonged to a different king. Joshua now has to take the faith of what he just heard, cross over and march around Jericho a few times. He had to put his faith in motion. The miracle is often in putting your faith in motion. Why? Because when you put motion to what you believe, you put a demand on the promise. And the demand on the promise says, is God righteous? We know that he is. God is not a man that he should lie. So when you add an effort to what you believe, see, the effort is evidence that you have faith. And when you quit trying, it's because you stopped having faith. It's not because you got tired. As long as you still believe, you'll keep trying. But you have to put an effort because the effort puts a demand on God's righteousness. And God is not a man that he should lie. But he who promised is faithful. Now, it might not happen right away. You might have to walk it out a little bit. But here's what I find. Is that a lot of the times there are things that we want. That we know God has promised, but we don't have it. And so we're like treading water waiting for him to do something. And it might be he's waiting for you to do something. You believe it, but now there has to be an effort. Some kind of motion put to it. See, those men woke up that morning and they knew what they wanted. Ten men, they said, let's go get our healing. Let's go find our Jesus. They knew what they wanted. Let's take a moment right now 
Maybe even close your eyes and think about what do I want that God has promised me and I don't have it. Is it, is it, is it a, a freedom from an addiction? Right? Is it freedom? Jesus has broken the bondages of addiction. He's broken the chains off your life. He's broken them. But it might be that now you have to go, okay, I'm not going to do it anymore either. That I'm going to have to take a, I'm going to go home today and throw that, all that stuff away because I'm done. Maybe it's depression. Maybe you're done with depression. You know the joy of the Lord is your strength. You know that Jesus has given you his joy. But every morning you wake up fatigued and here comes those thoughts of depression again. And that sadness and that darkness tries to get on you. And what I'm saying is, is that that promise is yours, but you might need to make a little effort. You might need to wake up in the morning and say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I rejoice in the Lord. All You might have to push back on that darkness just a little bit. And God will be strong where you have been weak, but you've got to take that first step out of the boat. You've got to make that move. Come on, somebody give the Lord a hand clap right now. Maybe you're done with that sickness. You've got to take a step. Maybe you're ready to have that prodigal come home and back into your life. And you know what God has said about the the children who are running from God. You know what he said. The promise is, 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 as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's me and my house. Come on, somebody. And so I know what the promise is, but I might need to send that text message out today. I might need to make a little effort. I'm so proud of you. I love you. I might need to throw some blessing that way. What am I doing? I'm trying to take a step towards the promise God's given me. When, when I was just dating Pastor Kelly for three weeks. By, by the way, can I just take a second? It's, just give me, it's Valentine's Day weekend. My wife, would you please stand up? I love you. Can I just honor you for a second? She's wearing one of her Valentine's Day gifts. I love this woman. She has given me the best life ever. Happy Valentine's Day. Maybe we'll do something tomorrow. What do you think? So uh, it, was, it was three weeks into our relationship that, that I had, I, I asked God a question. And the thing was, is I, was, I remember right where I was. I was at the conference center of the Arizona Grand, which used to be called the, the, the Pointed South Mountain. I was, we were going to play a concert that night at the conference center. And, and I just got done with the sound check. And I remember standing and looking up at the ceiling of the conference center. And, and, I, and I had dated the wrong girl. I mean, I was wrong for her. And she was wrong for me for three years. And uh, we had just broken up. Now I'm dating Kelly and for three weeks. And I, I said to the Lord, I didn't want to do three more years with somebody that wasn't the right one. So I just said to God, God, is she the right one? I just threw it out there. And this one of the few times I've ever heard God speak audibly in my ears. It boomed in my ears. I just heard, yes. And I was like, peace up, eight times. Yeah, yeah. If I do that, if I ever do that in the future, just please stand up. Don't leave me up here by my... You got to do it with me. Can you do that? I feel all alone up here. I was so excited, though. I was just, I was like, oh my gosh, yes, that was the one I wanted. And to hear God say that. You know, I had the promise now, and I had faith in that promise. I, had, I know what God said to me. But how many know that I still had to put the, the, the pedal to the metal? I still had to pursue this woman. There was a lot of pursuit that I had to do because there was a lot about me that if I had stayed the same, she would not have tolerated. There was a lot of things that Jason was going to have to go through and change in his life. And and then I needed to pursue her with all of my heart. I still had to win her. I didn't go and tell her, by the way. Hey, God told me you're going to. No, I didn't tell her until after we were married. I didn't play the God card on her. But, you know, there was still an effort, even though I had the promise. There was, uh, uh, just a few years ago, there was a, a day after church, I preached, and then I was getting in my car, and I called my wife. She had, she had left ahead, and Katie was still in college at the time. She wasn't married yet. She was at ASU, and there was something happening at ASU. And, and so I called Kelly. I said, where are you? She said, I'm on my way to Katie's thing at ASU. Go home, change your clothes. There's some eggs and bacon, and then come join me. And I go, oh, okay. This sounds great. So I drove home changed my clothes. I walked out to the kitchen and, and the kitchen's perfectly clean. And so I'm thinking, and so I look twice because here's the thing about men is for some reason, you ladies can see stuff we don't see. And we know that something magic happens when you walk in and you're like, it's right here. And you're like, it wasn't there. So I check twice and I'm like, there's no eggs or bacon. So I call her and I go, Hey hon, I can't find the eggs and bacon. And she goes, they're in the fridge. Okay, and she goes, can't you cook your own eggs and bacon? 
Nope, I can cook my own eggs. I'm capable of cooking. I just didn't know. I thought you were saying there were, okay, yes, I can cook my own eggs. And I believe that there's so many believers that are standing in the kitchen of life and God has put all the eggs and the bacon in the fridge, but you just won't go open the door. You keep waiting for the eggs and bacon to magically appear. And here's the reality. Ted got eggs and bacon, and Nancy got eggs and bacon, and everybody's getting eggs and bacon but you. In other words, a lot of times we're treading water in the, in the lake of life, and we're not swimming. And so we're still getting tired, but we're going nowhere. If you don't step out and go somewhere, here's the secret, then you're going nowhere. And God says, I'll bless the works of your hands, and everything that you touch is going to prosper. But often we get stuck in the routine of our normal paycheck-to-paycheck life. We, we forget to step out, and the only thing God's going to be blessing is how we're looking at our phone or the remote control. But it would be better to put those things down and take a step towards the dream God's placed in your heart. Do you have a dream of having a business? Do you have a dream of breaking poverty off of your family? You might have to read a book. You might have to step out in faith and start that business. You might have to take a risk. What am I saying? You're going to start swimming. Because when you're not swimming, and you see other people swimming, swimming, what happens is envy. Well, why are they going there? Why do they get that? Or why do they get that? And you're still swimming, but you're just complaining. No, no, it's better for you to be the swimmer. Maybe you're ready to get your, your health back in order. Maybe you're ready to take your, your temple back. It's been ruling over you long enough, and you're like, okay, but what are you going to do? Praise God, you've given me a healthy body, Father, and you've given me healthy desires, but you also might have to go home and clean out your pantry. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord some praise right now. You might have to take a step of faith. God will meet you in those places. God visits Abraham and he says, he says, what did he say? Leave. I need you to go. I need you to go where I'm sending you. Leave your, your family, your people, your country, and go to the place I'm going to show you. And then he says, and I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you. And you will be a blessing, and I will, I will make your name great. And I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. And all peoples will be blessed through you. So here's the promise. But how many know Abraham has to leave now? He's got to leave his country. This is a risky thing. He's got to talk his wife. What do you mean? Where are we going? What are you? Huh, Sarah, we're leaving. Where, what, why? Because God's, I heard a booming voice and there was this God speaking to me. Have you ever talked to God before? No, this is the first time. Well, what's he, why is he telling us to leave? I don't know, but we're going. Where are we going? I don't know. He told me, he showed me when we left. This is probably a hard conversation to have with a woman. Like he's going to need a lot of trust. But off he goes. You know, if he doesn't leave... But when he leaves, when he puts motion on his faith, it puts a demand on the promise because God said, if you move, I'm going to give you all this. So he's like, okay, I moved. Now hook me up. He's putting a demand on God's righteousness that God is not a man that he should lie. And when you put a demand on God's righteousness and you're operating in God's will, see, God, God's will is to see you receive his promises because it displays his righteousness on earth to everyone around you. When you get better, everybody else is seeing what God did for you. It's a display of his righteousness. So you're participating in the righteousness of God. Or in other words, I am the righteousness of God. Why? Because I believed him and I stepped out and he moved through me because I got on board with what he was doing on the planet. There's too many people people that can move mountains on this planet, that can raise the dead. There are too many people who can preach the gospel, who can heal the sick, who can see blind eyes opened, but they're not moving. Come on, somebody. There's too many people that are blessed to be millionaires and billionaires and changing this world and advancing the kingdom of God in the marketplace and paying for the advance and paying off churches and paying for the ministry and paying to help the poor. There are too many people that are called to it, but they're not stepping out into the partnership where God will move and be strong where you are weak. Come on, somebody. James chapter 2 says it this way, faith without deeds is dead. You can believe it, but if you're not moving, it doesn't do anything. There's a woman, he, he, he brings up in, in the book of James uh, about this woman named Rahab, and she was a prostitute in Jericho, and she ran a whole house of prostitution, and her, her establishment was in the wall of Jericho, and the spies came in to spy out from Joshua to spy out the city before they took it, and they went into this house of prostitution, and she hid them. The Bible says that the king of Jericho sent message to her, hey, where's those guys? Where'd they go? And she goes, oh, they left. They didn't, though. They were upstairs hiding. She said, I don't know. They, they, they left. I think they went over there. So the king sends people. He, she not only hides them, but helps sneak them out of the city. So James brings this up in the, in the book of James. In the New Testament, he's still talking about 
Rahab. In the same way, it was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous. I love this phrase. In the same way, was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous. I love how that reads. That just makes Pharisees just shake in their boots. They get so angry at a phrase like that. She was considered righteous for, for what? For stopping what she was, no, no, for what she did. When she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. Next verse. As the body is without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So her deeds was, she believed God had given Jericho to Joshua and the Israelites. And so she joined, she believed, see, the king said, sent a message to her. Are they there? But to her, there was a new king in town. I have to listen to this king no more because the city's been given to another king. The king of kings, Joshua. The, 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 also Joshua, which is a, a picture of Jesus. His name is the same as Jesus, Yeshua. So Jesus is now the king of Jericho. And she's decided to be obedient. She joined the right team. What's the result in her life? Well, Rahab not only is saved, because when the walls of Jericho fell, for some reason her establishment didn't, as the hand of God. It didn't move. Her and her whole, whole household were saved, by the way. Her, all of her family was in there hiding. And then she would come out and become an Israelite, right? Because she's not. She's a foreigner. But she marries into the Israelite community a guy named Salmon. A real fish of a guy, to be honest. <laughs> kind of slimy. But the thing was, is the, no, don't laugh at those corny jokes. But the thing was, is that really she had to give an effort. She had to swim upstream. <laughs> to spawn a new life. She really... What are you laughing at? So her and Salmon, <laughs> they have a baby. Their baby is named Boaz, who is the kinsman redeemer in the book of Ruth. Watch this now, the harlot. This is what God does for the harlot. Rahab, considered righteous. Then, then Boaz and Ruth have a kid named Obed. Obed has a kid named Jesse. Jesse has a king named King David. Somebody say amen. King David has a king Solomon. Kings came from this woman. Come on, somebody. All the way to the lineage of Christ. What did God do? What did she do? She just added effort. She, if she hadn't hid those spies, if she just, see, it was a risky thing for her to do, to hide those spies, but she, she hid those spies. She took the risk. She put her faith into motion. Putting your faith into motion is not, a, not, it's not an easy thing. It's a risky thing that you do. My mom, when she was diagnosed with incurable rheumatoid arthritis, and, and you were in your 40s, this is many, many years ago, that she woke up one morning, she couldn't walk. It was so aggressive. My dad had to carry around. She wouldn't get a wheelchair, but she began to pray scriptures. She knew that her healer had already healed her. See, she knew what the word of God said, that God sent his word and it has healed us, right? So she quoted the word, and then she'd have my dad carry her to the pool. And they would heat the pool up. We had a little gas heater on that thing, and, and she would walk around in the pool. And do exercises. She couldn't walk normally, but but in the pool she could. And she would visualize herself skiing and running and doing all these activities. And you know she didn't get better that day, and she didn't get better the next day, and she didn't get better a week later. It was still the same thing. But she still believed. She still believed what God had said over what the doctor said. So she refused to quit trying. And it was months until she received her healing. But there was a day when she walked into the doctor's office who had declared rheumatoid arthritis of her, and he said, "You're healed. You're cured." He didn't say healed. He said, "You're cured. I don't ever want to see." you again. I love that he said that. Come on, give the Lord some praise right now. But what did she have to do? She had to put motion to her face. She found a way to start moving in that direction. I have a neighbor many years ago. I was 24 years old and my neighbor across the street, he was a burly man. He was a, a tattooed and lots of hair and he was awesome. He was just pure awesomeness. You know, whenever I saw him, I was like, that guy's awesome. And and so one day I looked and his, his arm was all bandaged up and it was bandaged from, he had, had a grease fire. His arm had caught in fire from grease. And I was like, this guy's awesome. You know what I mean? Like if you got a grease, like what happened to your arm? Grease fire. You're like, oh my gosh. And he's working on his car with his other arm. I'm like, you're insane. You're incredible. So I, but I said to him, this is what came out of my mouth as I was talking to him. I said, I said, I'm going to pray for you. And I'm, I'm 24 years old. I've never really prayed out loud before in my whole life. And I was like, what are you saying? Like, why are you doing this? But the Holy Spirit inside of me, I think, was just making me say, I didn't even mean to. I'm going to pray for you. And this is what I said to him. I said, and when the doctor takes those bandages off, this is what he's going to say. He's going to say, 
you're healing better and faster than I've ever seen. And then he's going to, and then, and then when, after he says that, you're going to come to me and, and you're going to go to my church. And he goes, yeah, all right. So I pray for him, right? And it was like I was fumbling through the prayer. It was an absolutely awful prayer. You ever do that where you're, you're praying? You, you don't know what I'm doing. You ever hear those people that can pray really good? Like this, just like this beautiful thing comes out of their mouth. You're like, that, that's never been me. I'm like, oh my gosh, God's going to listen to that for sure because it's so pretty. But, but it doesn't matter what comes out of your mouth as long as it's some, at some point they're healed and it's in the name of Jesus. That's all that matters. You get, because why? Because there's power in, those, in the name of Jesus. When you call on the name of Jesus, people get saved. Things change when you call on that name. Somebody say amen. There's salvation through that name. And so I, I, at some point in there, I know I said healed in the name of Jesus. And I told him what the doctor was going to say. I said, and, and Lord, that the doctor's going to say this is, this is healing better and faster than I've ever seen. Well, it's maybe a couple weeks later as a knock on my door. I open the door, his bandage is removed, and he said, it was exactly like you said. The doctor said to me, it healed better and faster than he's ever seen. He goes, where's your church? He came to our church with his wife. He got born again that weekend. Somebody say amen. You know, that was a risky thing. It was risky for Rahab to hide the spies. It was risky for me to, to put that kind of demand on God's righteousness, but... but Life is risky. And if, if, if the reason we're not trying to start that business, if the reason that you're not going back to school is because it's risky. If, it, if the reason you're not starting that book is because it's risky. If you're, if you're having a hard time stepping out, everything's risky. It's okay. Every day we get up and take risks. What's not risky? You got married. That was risky. You had kids. That was risky. Driving down the 202 North is risky. Right? Doing a church with your brother, that's risky. <laughs> Swimming in the ocean. I, I, I read the statistic the other day. There's a one in three million chance that you will be eaten by a shark when you swim in the ocean. It's risky. Even swimming in the ocean is risky. Everything's risky. Jim Rohn, one of the great life, uh, personal development coaches you've ever heard. Um, <clears throat> if you've never heard him, you need to read some of his books. He said this. If you think trying is risky, wait till they hand you the bill for not trying. You know, when we try, we get better, whether you win or, win or, whether you win or lose. I, I believe that's why the Bible says that a righteous man fails seven times. It's because he just keeps trying. The reason he falls seven times is because he won't give up. He just keeps trying. But it says that he keeps getting up. It's not that we don't fail. It's, it's that we keep getting up. The real failure is when you don't try. Because when you try, no matter what, here's what's going to happen. You're going to get better. In Matthew chapter 14 and verse 27, Peter Peter's going to walk on water here. He's, they see Jesus walking on water. They're in the boat. They're straining at the oars. And, they, and they're scared. They like, think it's a ghost. And Jesus says, hey, listen, take courage. It's I. Don't be afraid. Peter says this, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. So he steps out of the boat. There's 12 guys in the boat, but only one steps out of the boat. I want to be the one. That's, that's what I'm trying to encourage you to do. The reason he's going to walk on water is because he tried. And here's the reality I want you to hear, is that this was a story about identity. Because he said to Jesus, if it's you, this is a question of identity. He says, if it's you, tell me to come. He was prophesying to a time when we live today that whatever G he was saying, whatever you can do, I know that I can do. If that's you, Jesus, and you're doing it, then I know that I can do it. Because Jesus said, those who follow me will do what I have been doing. In fact, greater works will you do than I have done. As he is in this world, so am I. So he was saying... If that's you, tell me to come, because whatever you can do, I can do. And here's the reality. Number one, he failed. He walked on the water. Yes, that's a win, but he fell on the water. But number two, he didn't actually go anywhere in terms of a destination. And here's the reality. God is not always interested so much in the destination as he is in who you're becoming. Because where he went didn't matter, but who he became is what mattered. Something happened on the inside of him through that experience. He grew on the inside. Why? Because he realized potential. And you can come to church every single week, and I will tell you the word of God, and it will build up your faith. But without stepping out of the boat, you will never realize your potential. 
Realizing your potential only comes through experience. You have to try things to find out what you're capable of. If you want to know what your identity is, start trying more stuff because your identity is realized in what you're capable of. It's the potential of God in you because you have unlimited potential on the inside of you. And you step out and do something you know you can't do, but you stepped out anyways because God will do the impossible. You just have to do the possible things. And then you realize on the inside of you. I could do it all along. The only thing that was holding me back is I wouldn't try. Come on, somebody. He falls in, but who cares? He became something. And so many people take a job because of what they're going to get per hour, but don't take a job because of what you're going to get. Take a job because of what you're going to become. It's about growing. And if you could put a little bit of emotion behind what God wants to do in your life and the thing that he's promised. And notice what it says. Jesus went about doing good. Jesus was the Messiah, the son of God, but he didn't sit in his lake house and just go, Father, I just trust that you're going to make all this happen for me. And, and I'm, I'm going to be the Messiah and I'm going to die on the cross one day. No, no. It says that he went about doing good. In order for Jesus to live his destiny, he had to put his faith into motion and heal the sick and raise the dead. Can somebody give the Lord some praise right now? That's what he's up to, going about, and that has to be what we're up to. And so here's my challenge to you today. Let's just take a moment and pray. And I want you to think about God's promises and his deliverances and the desires of your heart that he's given you. And what is God up to in your life? Is he wanting to break poverty off your life this morning? Depression, be gone. Is he wanting to break addiction off your life? It's time to get healthy. Is he wanting to lose some bonds, heal you from that sickness or that disease? Is that what you want? Prodigals to come home? What I'm saying today is find a way to make an effort. What an amazing word today. Take time this week to meditate on that word and get it deep into your heart. I want to ask you all a question. If you were to face eternity today, do you know what eternity looks like for you? And would you have peace with Father God? Here's the good news. God has already offered the free gift of salvation, eternal life, to anyone who will believe. You might say, well, believe what? Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for your sins and rose from the dead. Make him the Lord of your life today. Make him the King of your heart. And I just have a prayer. If you repeat after me, you can have that eternal life today. Dear Father God, please forgive me of all my sins. And Jesus, I believe in you. You're the Son of God who died for sin and rose from the dead. Be my Lord and my Savior, in Jesus' name, amen.